Hey, welcome folks. This is the last Washington County Public Affairs Forum of our season, 2013-2014, and as your outgoing president, I've got a couple responsibilities. First, I need to report on the health of the organization. What I'd like to uh, remind you of is when we had our county commissioner races in here, I made uh, a few announcements, one of which is that we pivoted to being a training organization to make sure that our Video and audio programs continue. Joseph Tyner has not only completed basic uh, video production at Twelve Dolly Community Television, he's just about to wrap up the editing class, which is going to fulfill a long-term legacy that the forum has aspired to. That is to take and keep video production in-house, which is uh, remarkable because over the several decades, we have spent a tremendous amount of money on from our dues to message to the public what we do here. And by taking control of that in the last forum season or two, we've been able to change what uh, directly affects you. We have lowered our dues. And the last forum season, we went from $55 per year dues to $45 per year in dues. What I'm pleased to report is that our beginning balance was $3,793 even, and this is separate from the $3,000 or so dollars we keep as an emergency fund. Our um, closing value um, is um, $6,335.82. So we've not spent a lot of money this year. However, we have spent a little bit of money to increase um, some of the technology that we're doing. So we bought some things such as power conditioners and uh, most importantly for me, to keep our video production, um, we have taken what's called raw files. So basically, the electronic version of tape that we use now, and we've stored this on Blu-ray discs. So we're storing about 20 to 25 gigabytes of information that eventually is stored with our partners at Twalton Valley Water, Twalton Valley uh, Fire and Rescue, who houses uh, uh, many of our important uh, documents, and also our old DVDs from Cable Access was uh, producing our TV shows. So we are able to not only uh, spread the word, but we're creating a historical legacy that others, uh, people will be able to research in, uh, for years to come. I'd like to close on that by stating that people do watch this. And uh, about a year or two ago, we had the um, uh, Supreme Court race where Willamette Week trolled through our video archives to fact check what was said in a Supreme Court race. And I thought that was uh, wonderful that we were able to provide that service. And that, I think, is what the forum is all about, is being good, clear communicators and also creating a public record. The, the, the forum is, is the body of record for most important political uh, uh, discussions in Washington County and has since 1956. Uh, as your outgoing president, um, you have just a few more seconds to throw things at me before I duck out and we, I'm replaced. Um, but I do want to thank you all. It's been a tremendous privilege and quite the learning experience to, to be of service to you as your president. Uh, what I'd like to do now is read the ballot, which uh, we will hopefully have a vote on. And the ballot is as follows. Uh, for Director 2017, John Hutzler. Director 2015, John McWilliams. Treasurer, Anthony Mills. Secretary, Phil Nelson. Second Vice President, Chris Leslie. First Vice President, Rob Solomon. And President, John Tyner. I'd like to call to the audience and see if there's a motion to accept the ballot. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, would you say, signify by saying aye? Aye. Any opposed? Well, thanks. Um, and I'm going to pop. <laughs> Excellent. As your new president, John Tyner, is making his way up here, I'd like to uh, just uh, warmly thank uh, two very exciting additions to the board, and that's Mr. Anthony Mills and Mr. Rob Solomon. I think uh, your fresh energy to the board is going to be warmly welcomed and will uh, mix nicely with uh, the seasoned expertise of the forum executives that you join. Uh, folks, I introduce to you your new president, John Tyner. Thank you. Thank you. Service to the uh, forum. Uh, basically, um, I, I'm going to be the, the steward of the forum for the, in the fall, and we have a, we have some challenges ahead of us. Essentially, the the um, what do you think? The defib part of the uh, organization is over. We defibbed um, uh, two years ago. We've got to, we really have to reorient again. Uh, I want to make sure that the fall is our biggest um, attendance, and we want to make sure we do that right. 
So let me just tell you a little bit of what, what we've got planned. Um, I don't want to steal Professor Moore's um, speech from him, but um, there's kind of a, there were really only uh, seven or eight contested races that we're going to be we're looking at. We're going to start right after Labor Day, and we're going to go through to um, just a, a little bit um, prior to Thanksgiving, probably the last, um, uh, probably the 17th. We'd ask Professor Moore, if he would, uh, to calendar that, um, the 17th. But literally, there's only the Senate race, Congress in first district, uh, 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 excuse me, Senate, Congress, and uh, governor race that are contested. And we only have two state Senate races, the Star and Riley race in Hillsborough, and um, and I think the, the Steiner uh, Vierbeck race in, in um, East County, and literally um, three contested House races: Davis, Squires, McLean, Richmond, Gallegos, Mason. And we only have, I think there's only one ballot measure which has got the requisite number of signatures. And I think that's the immigration one. Several have been tied up in the courts, and uh, Professor Moore will tell us more about that. But essentially, we're going to we're not going to waste any of your time on. on um, uncontested races or things of that nature. We're, gonna, we're just going to have meat races. We're also going to try to collaborate. I spoke to Professor Moore about uh, my conversation with Pam Treese, who's head of the West Side Business Alliance. We're going to see if we can get the um, Senate um, debate in Washington County um, any way we can. We'd like to be at the forum or, or some association with the forum. Pacific University has extended an invitation to um, the Senate candidates to debate at Pacific University and some other folks, too. So. The forum may be in a partnership with other organizations to see if we can get that Senate um, debate in Washington County. Kit is pretty good about coming to uh, here, and I think uh, uh, Representative Richardson would, would be here. But we're going to have a fairly, I'm not going to waste your time with um, uncontested races and things like that. We're going to have contested state Senate um, races, House races, and if we can get the Senate race um, here, well, I know the governor's race, so they will show up. and. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Bonavici and um, and Delita Morgan will, will will come to the forum. So Monday after Labor Day, till about the 17th of November, which is about a 10-week period of time, we're going to have substantive races, substantive debates of candidates, and I think you're going to enjoy that. And um, we will publish, we will mail or, or email notices, so you'll be aware of those in advance. We may not be at the pepper mill, we may be at the pepper mill. We may be able to, to um, work with some other folks to, to assure um, the debates occur. So again, short November, but it's always our big attendance uh, period of time. The pepper mill may not be able to hold all the folks. Again, any questions before I introduce Professor Moore or any suggestions other than not talking so long? Yes, Harry. The, um, two weeks ago, <coughs> Senator, my, my state senator was invited to speak and failed to show. The last time she was invited, she was invited, accepted, she failed to show. She sent a surrogate. She did a good job. But I, I would like for the former to say if the candidate cannot show up, you don't get to sit in plan B. The um, I, 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 I support that. I think that's that's appropriate. People are going to show up because um, one of my most winning qualities is the, my tenaciousness. <laughs> and so um, anyone who says they're going to show up and doesn't show up without an excused absence will will um, not be unpenalized. Let's put it that way. We will make sure people show up. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question uh, on some of these races, indeed, surely with the governor, the seating capacity here is rather limited. Is there any, can we just kick this around, is there any way that members will have some assurance of being able to sit before non-members? I'm glad you brought that up. That's, we've looked at some other places. We had a meeting at Ernesto's, which was very well attended. Ernesto's has a good capacity. The um, Elks Club is not available for uh, for purposes of um, anything until it, it's revamped. It's purchased by, I guess, some Japanese business people who are revi revamping it. Um, the Spaghetti Factory is available. It has a large capacity. What, we, what I want to do is just look through here um, and see. 
Traditionally, in the, in the November general election, we have large attendance. This will not be adequate, obviously, for a governor's race or something of that nature, and we'll find an alternative place to do that. Uh, and we'll give you uh, advanced word. We will be giving House races a full slate of time to debate the issues instead of just shoehorning a bunch of uh, folks together and some who don't show up, some who do. We will have a quality product and for a House race, the Pepper Bill is probably adequate. For a Senate, a state Senate race, it, it may not be. For a, for a, if the first district is actually contested, if Linda Morgan is able to build a campaign, this may not be adequate. And as I said, we want to partner with Pacific University, perhaps at their facilities. And this is not unprecedented. 30 years, I guess more than 30 years ago, when I was on the board, we did things, with, we did the governor, uh, in 86 we did um, Paulus Goldschmidt at, at Pacific University, it was, it filled their, it exceeded, almost exceeded their capacity to, um, to hold the things. So we're gonna make the accommodations, and the reason I'm serving as president is I wanna make sure that we don't lose the opportunity that form has had in the general election to, um, to get candidates out here. So I'm gonna be sensitive to that, and we're gonna be, uh, very responsive to folks, so you'll know where the um, here meetings are going to be, and, and we'll we will have a sense, better sense of that once we speak to the candidates about it. So, yes, sir. Does that answer your question? Almost. Maybe we could arrange a time frame for members to, to enter, and then after that, open it to everybody else. And then, I think that's a good idea. I hadn't even thought of that, but you're right. If, if you're a member, you should have priority, not just on questions, but on seating. This encourages mm -hmm. membership, obviously. Correct. Correct. Um, we'll, that, that's a very good idea. And what we're, we're basically, he wants to reward members. We've had some contested house races uh, here and uh, other races which, in which it's been too crowded for people to get in to this, and his uh, suggestion was that we prioritize by forum membership seating access to those debates, if the, if the Pepper Mill is gonna be the situs for those uh, debates. But again, the big picture is, yes, John? Yeah. It seems to me that we're a little bit premature. We haven't had a board meeting to talk about what we're gonna be doing. Correct, yeah. correct, really correct, I have to say what something. Move or right, like exactly, uh, I, we're just talking about the parameters of the possible, yes, John? Um, the Hillsborough Elks Lodge has got a very large uh, area that they could have the meetings too, and that is available for lunch hours. Uh, I'm not sure about Mondays, but that's the normal day off. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mondays are day off? Or the uh, cooking. Mm -hmm. oh, mm. Well, we that's... The VM, the Hillsborough, uh, I remember I'm a trustee for Beaver. Beaver right. Lodge is sold, and sometime in the next six months we'll be out there too. Well, John pointed out that John, John pointed out this was a board prerogative. I'm just tossing in some of the things because the members wanted to know what we spoke about that earlier. The board's going to decide where we are, but my guess is that a Pacific University lands in accordance with a lot in association with the Westside Business Alliance and the forum. The senator candidates at Pacific University, and we were all able to publicize that. Then the venue would be Pacific University and whatever day that they can get it, and that would be a substitution for the Monday meeting. Pacific, how many, how many folks can you seat there? Well, we about 550. Right, we, we, we did that in 86 with the Paulus um, Goldschmidt debate, which I was, think was the first of the <coughs> kickoff things, and it, it almost exceeded the capacity of Pacific University, so it, it always depends, it depends a little bit up on which races catch fire, et cetera. And as John noted, that is a board prerogative, but I think if we can, with some of the contacts we make, we will try to make sure by priority if we're here for something that members will get seated first and yeah, things of that nature. But we may have partnerships which allow us to land the bigger debates. Good enough, Bill? John. Uh, have we thought about having it at a different time? Most of the area are working during this hour and are not able to come. Have we ever tried the evening meetings or? We, we have a lot of discussion about that, but um, and that's one of the things about what the forum is and what, what would become and what partnerships we set up. And the Monday just works uh, for the for the November. We may we will be doing something different in the in the spring, uh, possibly, 
I don't know if we'd be meeting weekly. I don't know if we'd be meeting in, 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 on the Monday afternoons. I th and we may be driven by subject matter, too. Uh, we want to keep it relevant. We want to keep it interesting. But we want to keep it on a cycle that's predictable. So, but at least in November, aside from the perhaps the collaborative meetings, Monday would be the time. But after that, I mean, I'm open to anything, basically. And uh, we'll see how it rolls. Without further ado, then, or a commotion, <laughs> uh, basically, Professor Moore comes to us, and he has, as a service to the community, he, he, he comes out and speaks to folks. He comes to the forum loyally, and his remarks are prescient. As you know, he's quoted on the news. He's, he's quoted very regularly. He's one of the true experts. And um, we are, it's just it's wonderful to have him here. And he also teaches my son, so I can't <laughs> essentially kiss up enough, I suppose. But, um, but so Professor Moore, uh, thank you for sharing your time here. We really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll be able to collaborate and maybe help facilitate the appearance of the Senate candidates in Washington County. Thank you very much. Let me get set up here. Water to the side. Watch so I can see. So it's been two weeks since I've seen you. <laughs> Hope you had a good Memorial Day. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to look at the results of the election, but more importantly, we're going to look ahead to November. Uh, I just have to tell you, when I left here uh, two weeks ago, I was in the middle of a bunch of meetings at Pacific. Went back to the meetings. Uh, then checked my voicemail, and among other people who had called, um, Rachel Maddow from MSNBC, so I was on her show that night, which was kind of fun. Um, she was actually taking off on all the interesting people who contribute money to Republican causes. Uh, so if you recall, last week we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked a little bit about Lauren Parks. Uh, she just thought he was very interesting. Uh, so we were talking about that kind of stuff, um, pretty fun. And then, I don't know what cause and effect is, but that same day I found out when I was doing election coverage the next day on OPB, uh, someone started a fake Twitter account in my name. So there's not Jim Moore, who um, it, you know does not analysis of what's going on. Uh, so just in case you see a Twitter account, it says Jim Moore, not. And that's not me. So let's look at the election results. Um, first thing, turnout, 35 to 36%, a little bit lower than I thought it was going to be. The big difference in the last day, when we look at the, the, the votes that came in, the ballots, there were about 40 to 60,000 votes fewer that came in than we've seen in comparable primaries. So something happened in those last days where we just didn't have a chunk of people that turned in their ballots. Um, comparison to the rest of the country, the rest of the country is, is averaging 13% turnouts in primary elections. Texas just had a primary and they had a 7% turnout. So compared to that, we're doing great, even though it's not good by Oregon standards. Uh, but clearly the quality of the race and what the excitement is among the electorate is important. In Jackson County and Josephine County, where they had the GMO measures, they had over 55% turnout for the primary. And in Josephine County, that meant that they voted overwhelmingly to ban GMO crops, and they also voted overwhelmingly not to give more money to the Sheriff's Department to continue the downward spiral in public safety in Josephine County. So those, those, uh, clearly an exciting major can drive turnout in a primary. Uh, as we talked about two weeks ago, we didn't really have that with this, the Senate race, kind of never really took off. And there were pockets of high turnout around the state, but overall not that great when we look at it. Uh, Multnomah County, Washington County, Clackamas County were down towards the bottom in terms of turnout, as they usually are in primaries. So the state average is 35, 36. We were at about 31, 32 percent here in Washington County. Um, <clears throat> for the fall, turnout is also going to be crucial. When we don't have a presidential election, we have usually anywhere from 350 to about 600,000 fewer voters than we would have in a presidential election. So we're expecting statewide about 400,000 fewer voters than we saw in 2012. 
What's the pattern in that? The pattern in that is that Republicans do better with that lower percentage turnout. So we saw Republicans pick up seats in the Oregon legislature in 2010, in 2006. They lost seats in the Oregon legislature, presidential years 2008, 2012. So we're looking at that same pattern as going to be probably what goes on as we get into the fall elections. Uh, let's get into uh, some of the races themselves. U.S. Senate, boy, that ended up being pretty fun in the last uh, four days. Um, so Monica Webby wins by about 13% uh, when all is said and done. Uh, did the revelations about uh, stalking and all that other kind of stuff in the last four days have an impact? Absolutely. When the ballots are counted on election night, the county clerks have them all set up. So they just push a button and in they go into the machine. The ballots they don't count first are the ones that come in that Tuesday and usually about midday of the Monday before. So it's those ballots that were cast over that last weekend or those last days of the election. So Monica Webby with that first batch of ballots was up 53-54% of the total Republican vote. At this point, her numbers are at 49.99%. Of those who voted in the last few days, she took a significant hit. And the only thing we can attribute that to is to the revelations that were wandering around in the news. So two weeks ago, somebody asked about whether or not um, um, negative campaigning works. Yes, it does. It's got to be really focused and really short. This was an example of that. It depressed the number of people who voted for her that probably otherwise would have voted for her. So that's something she's got to deal with. So now we look at, at the, the Webby Merkley race coming up. Um, people back, back in DC, um, in fact, uh, geez, Louise, I was just in the Washington Post this morning about this very thing. Uh, the phone started ringing a lot after Rachel Maddow. Um, but uh, so people back in DC find Webby to be a really attractive candidate. She's got a great slogan, change your doctor, no, change your senator, not your doctor. Keep your doctor. Um, she's got good expertise in health care. Um, but here on the ground, it's clear from her reaction to scandalous kinds of things that she's not ready for prime time. She's got to really spend a lot of time this summer figuring out how you answer these questions, how you do it quickly, and how you move on. Part of that is not just the scandal kinds of things. Remember, she refused to take part in any meaningful debates. Um, so she's got a lot, of, a lot of growth that she's got to go through this summer. So uh, right now, as we look at polling on this, Merkley is up by about 10 to 13 points. Merkley is kind of 47 to 50 percent. Webby is kind of 33, 34, 35, 36, 37 percent. Um, comparison, six years ago when Gordon Smith was running for re-election, the first polls so showed Gordon Smith up by 4 percent over Merkley. And that number stayed exactly the same until the economy fell apart at the end of September that year. And then Merkley went up by 4%. And that's basically, it ended up being a close election, but Merkley ended up winning. And so Webby right now is where you would expect a generic Republican to be. If we just said, who would you support for the US Senate, a Republican or a Democrat? That's exactly where we'd expect a generic Republican to be. Merkley is where you'd expect a generic Democrat to be. But in the grand scheme of things, he just has to be generic Democrat, whereas Webby has to be something remarkable that gains votes and peels away a lot of Democrats from Merkley. So clearly an uphill battle for her. Um, we'll see how that goes this summer. She uh, had more than a million dollars that she raised for herself, and another million was spent for her by outside groups. Uh, just as a comparison, uh, two years ago, four years ago, Chris Dudley had to spend $10 million to come really close to defeating John Kitzhaber. So Webby's got to be raising a lot of money this summer. If she's not, then that's going to tell us something important about her ability as a candidate as we go forward into the fall elections. Uh, looking at the gubernatorial race, uh, no problems for Dennis Richardson, John Kitzhaber. Uh, you know, they make it through. Basically the same set of issues for Dennis Richardson. Dennis Richardson is down by kind of 10 to 13 percent. 
Kitzhaber is polling as you would expect a generic Democrat, around 50%. Richardson is kind of a little low for a generic a Republican, kind of 37%. Um, but he's, he's in that generic area. And so Richardson has got to show that he can put together a campaign and connect with people. The money that he raises will not come from out of state unless he shows that he's going to come really close um, to, to uh, taking on Kitzhaber. At this point, we don't see that. Remember, once again, Chris Dudley four years ago, $10 million. Dennis Richardson at this point has raised somewhere around uh, $315,000. At this point, Chris Dudley had well over a million and a half, almost two million in the bank. So there's a big difference there. Dennis Richardson, just for comparison on the $315,000 that he's raised, that's what you would spend in a moderately competitive Oregon house race. That's not a statewide gubernatorial race. That's a moderately competitive Oregon house race. So once again, we're going to be looking carefully at Richardson. Can he raise money and get things going? Uh, Kitzhaber, once again, just basically needs to kind of play defense. He just needs to be the generic Democrat, and, and things will work out for him. Uh, if Richardson's numbers begin to move, we expect Kitzhaber to become pretty aggressive. Uh, but at this point, it, it, it doesn't look that bad for Kitzhaber, and it doesn't look that good for, for Richardson. A little comparison as well, for those of you who might remember the 1998 gubernatorial elections, Kitzhaber's first defense when he went for his second term, Bill Sizemore was a Republican candidate that year. Uh, Bill Sizemore uh, was defeated by the greatest percentage difference that we've had in, in Oregon history. Uh, Bill Sizemore not only couldn't raise money, uh, but his staff kept quitting on him, which is a bad sign when you're running for something. Um, and a lot of Republicans actually came out and supported Kitzhaber, including raising a lot of money for him. Um, and so we're not going to see that kind of a fracture this time. Richardson is a solid candidate, but we've got to see Richardson really put things together with a strong message and the money to get that message out there. So far, he hasn't shown that at all. Looking at the, uh, the Oregon legislature um, here in Washington County, uh, we're basically not going to have that much going on. Um, the race that probably is going to be the one to watch here is going to be Bruce Starr and Chuck Riley. Uh, this is a rematch. Bruce Starr uh, defeated Chuck Riley rather handily four years ago. Uh, the Rileys, Chuck and Katie, uh, have uh, several defeats in the past several years. Uh, but if there's going to be a chance for an upset in Washington County, that's going to be it. That's where we're going to see the race go. Once again, we've got to look carefully at the money. Uh, is Chuck Riley raising money? Is he getting a message out? Remember, Bruce Starr has become something of a, an island of a Republican in this county. We're becoming more and more Democratic. Bruce Starr, on paper, ought to be somebody who should be able to be defeated by a Democrat. Um, the polling that happened earlier this year, I got uh, a, a couple of phone polls that were interesting floating out names. It, you know, would you support this person if they ran against Bruce Starr? Also the same thing, would you support this person if they ran against Andy Dyke for the county commission seat? Um, but clearly those polling results showed that uh, people were pretty happy with Bruce Starr, so we didn't see any of the major names come in. Um, and so that's where we are. Uh, Bruce Starr, on paper, is someone who ought to be able to be defeated, uh, but the quality of the candidate is an issue. And Chuck Riley, just like we saw at the statewide races, Chuck Riley's got to be able to raise a lot of money and convince a lot of people out in that Senate district. Moving to the House. Um, oh, let's, let's do it as we're here. There's going to be two Senate races in the state that are going to be ones that we're going to be watching carefully. Remember, the state, the, the Senate is basically, it's a one-seat majority for the Democrats. And so, you know, what's going to happen with that? So the Republicans are really targeting District 3, which is Ashland Medford. It's Alan Bates. He's going to be going against uh, Dave Dodderer. Bates beat Dodderer by 275 votes four years ago. And so the Republicans are saying, let's do it again, and this time we can beat them. Uh, we'll see what happens. The district has been slightly rejiggered because we had uh, the, the boundaries change in the interim. And 
in terms of the demographics, we've seen a few more Democrats added into the district just in the way they drew it in the town of Medford, which I know well because I live basically on the border where they draw the, drew the, uh, the, uh, the line. Um, and so we'll see what happens with that, but that's one that both parties are going to be really focusing on. Clearly, if the Republicans do that, they move into a tie in the Senate. The Democrats keep it, then they keep their 16. Uh, the other one is in District 8, the Corvallis-Albany area. Uh, this is uh, where Betsy Close was appointed in 2012. She's a Republican. Um, it's the same district that has Oregon State in it. It's got Albany and Corvallis in it. And it has about 7,000 more Democrats than Republicans in it. And so the Democrats are also really targeting this. This would be to change an R to a D. And so then the, Repub the Republicans then go from 14 seats to 13 seats. And so we'll see what that is. But what all this means with these, just these two really competitive races in the whole state is we're basically looking for the Oregon Senate to basically stay the same. It might move one seat up or down. And even if it goes to a tie, the history shows that when it's a tie, the Democrats kind of run the place. Um, and so we'll see, but it, does, it doesn't look like there's going to be much change there. Now the Oregon House, uh, there's a chance for more movement there. Uh, Oregon House, let's look at Washington County first. Um, so we've got 12 seats here. Remember, six of them were already decided in the primary because there were no Republicans on the other side. So there you go. Um, so uh, let's kind of move through these. Uh, our own Eric Squires uh, running in State House 26, uh, going against John Davis. Um, hard to defeat an incumbent. Eric's going to have a real fight on his hands to make this happen. Um, it, it can be done, but remember, this is a weird district. It kind of starts here and it goes down to Wilsonville, so it, it has a lot of different groups in it. And so to, to basically connect there, you got to cover a lot of territory and you really have to connect with a lot of different groups. Wilsonville people don't talk to people up here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be a tough district. Uh, can be done, uh, but it's tough to beat an incumbent. Tough to beat an incumbent. Okay. Uh, going down the list here, we have two of the races that have decided who controls the Oregon House in the past six years right here. House District 29 and House District 30. And guess what? This year they're up again, and they could swing back. So they used to be Democrat, they went Republican, they went Democrat, and now because we have that lower turnout, they could go Republican again. So in House District 29, this is Forrest Grovish going over to Hillsboro. This is Ben Unger's old seat. Um, we have Mark Richmond and Susan McLean. Susan McLean, the Democrat, Mark Richmond, the Republican. Uh, just looking at the way the election turned out in 2012, turnout is not only everything, but different parts of turnout, for instance, in Cornelius versus Forest Grove. And so the candidates have got to really focus on that. Given what's happened in the past four election, three election cycles, I fully expect this to switch. Um, neither candidate is incredibly strong. Um, and so party identification is going to be really important when you go into this race. And with that uh, party identification with a lower turnout, that favors the Republican. So the Democrats have got to be working on just getting every Democrat they can find to actually vote. Uh, looking at House District 30, this is where Joe Gallegos is the incumbent right now, but it also has swung back and forth, back and forth. Uh, Joe Gallegos is acknowledged to be a, a weak incumbent. Uh, hasn't really done much to connect with the entire district. He's done a lot of things that have to do with his expertise in uh, especially um, social issues. Um, he's a, basically a social worker. Um, that's what he was a professor of for years and years and years. Uh, so he's good at that, but connecting with other things is tough. Um, he's a campaigner who is really good kind of one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but as a former teacher, it's not, he's not that good with bigger groups. So we'll see what happens here. We'll see what happens here. Um, when you look at, at Dan Mason, the, the, he's, he's a strong candidate on paper. The pattern suggests that this is, could be another swing. If the Democrats keep either of these seats, then they have a strong chance of keeping their majority in the Oregon House, where they have a four-seat majority. But the Republicans have to take both of them to swing the House to the Republican side. Okay.
that those are, those are our hometown races. You'll have the candidates here. There's going to be a lot of interest from the entire state around these races. It'll be really, really fun to watch all of that. Uh, then you get a whole bunch of people who are in safe seats, um, you know, all these other kinds of things. Uh, we had House District 34, remember that had the three Democrats? Well, great, we had a winner, uh, Ken Helm wins, and there's no Republican. So guess what, he gets to go to the State House. So the, the rest of the, the House seats don't look that interesting here, uh, but we'll see what happens, we'll see what happens. Statewide, we have Basically, three seats targeted by the Democrats, where there's either an incumbent or somebody has left the office. And we have two more seats, besides the two in Washington County, targeted by the Republicans. So notice with the Republicans, that's two here and two in the rest of the state. That's four. If they win all of them, that just gets them into a tie in the Oregon House. It doesn't get them the speakership on their own. It gets them to a tie. Whereas the Democrats have got five seats that they're targeting, you know, trying to defend and target and do all those things. And so if they're successful, they will increase their majority. Um, and that majority, remember, you get the 36 votes in the House, and you can pass tax measures um, and do all sorts of things like that. Uh, so it's, it's big, big things for both of them. But the, the Republicans, in effect, it looks like, are just going for the tie. They're not going for the outright win when you look at the House. It could happen, but th that's what they're looking at. So just quickly, where are some of these? Uh, House District 20 in Salem. Uh, we have, uh, this is Vicki Berger's old seat. Uh, Vicki Berger is, has left after years and years and years. Uh, Kathy Goss and Paul Evans targeted by the Democrats, basically because the demographics have changed. So that there's, there's more Democrats in the district itself. Um, then you get House District 52, which is um, in the Hood River area. Uh, there's Mark Johnson, who's an incumbent Republican. He's perceived as weak, and also that district is going more and more Democratic. A cool way to look at Hood River, uh, if you look at who votes for Democratic statewide candidates and Republican statewide candidates, from president to governor to Senate, all those things, Hood River has started voting exactly like Multnomah County. So there's always this blue island, if you do it by county size, there's this blue island, and then there's a lot of red around the state where not, that, not as many people live. Hood River is now part of that Multnomah County blue. And so the Democrats have said, you know, I think we can win this seat. Um, so they're focused on that. Uh, and then we have uh, the Bend seat. This was Jason Conger's seat that he resigned to run for the US Senate. Uh, the, it's Democratic on paper, which is interesting. Demographic changes. Bend has had a lot of growth in population in the past 15 years. It slowed down with the recession, but had, it has resulted in a district that is on paper a Democratic district. Uh, it's going to be a real uphill battle for the Democrats to win this, however, because the person who won the Republican primary is Newt Bueller. And Newt Bueller you know, ran for Secretary of State two years ago, really well known in the area, and he's a moderate Republican, and a moderate Republican will be able to get those Democratic votes to come across. So I don't think that the, the Republicans are going to lose that one, uh, but boy, the Democrats are going to aim and, and see what happens with Newt. Um, I like Newt because he has a beard, so that's good. Uh, and then uh, when we look at, at a, a couple of others that the Republicans are targeting, there's uh, House District 10 in Oregon City. This is uh, Brent Barton. Uh, this was Dave Hunt's district forever and ever and ever. Uh, Brent Barton's basically been in, for, this is his first time, so he's seen as, as weak. And so the, the Democrats are, are, are the Republicans, excuse me, the Republicans are really targeting this one. And then the other one that they're targeting is House District 51, which is Multnomah County going into Clackamas County. This is the other one of the four that was the revolving door that moved us from Democrats having four to a tie back to Democrats having four. So these revolving door districts, the Republicans are looking and saying, we can revolve them back. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of money spent in those particular districts as we get out there as well. Uh, a, a note about uh, something I talked about a couple of weeks ago. We were looking at Republican primaries around the state. There were conservatives, uh, social conservative and fiscal conservatives, almost Tea Party-ish, who were running against either kind of the establishment ones or the incumbent in the case of Vic Gilliam and uh, uh, Jim Thompson. There were three of those races, and the conservatives won in two of those three races. Um, and so we have an interesting thing uh, going on nationally. The Tea Party 
is not doing as well as it has in the past. Although it did do well in Texas, that 7% turnout turns out to be great for the Tea Party in a primary. But other Tea Party people running for the Senate and the Congress and things like that have, have been defeated. But here in Oregon, where the Tea Party really has not had an electoral toehold anywhere, we have these conservatives who have won these primaries, and they are basically going to walk in because they either don't have an opponent or it's a district that's just overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, there was one that uh, the Oregonian especially focused on. They said there was another district, uh, the 25th, which was in uh, Bill Post, Barbara Jensen, Kim Thatcher's old seat um, down in, in the Salem area. They said, oh, Bill Post was a conservative. I didn't include him for two reasons. First of all, uh, the other ones, it was as if the conservatives were taking on the party establishment. That's, and that's the Tea Party way that it does things. Uh, Bill Post, who won, was actually endorsed by Kim Thatcher, which is not taking on the establishment, as far as I can tell. Um, and his opponent, uh, Barbara Jensen, her biggest thing in her campaign was that everybody ought to have a gun. Uh, she was a, a gun rights person from the get-go, and so I didn't see really the differences going on there, and so that wasn't on my list, but the Oregonian put it on their list. Okay, um, Here in Washington County, Things basically went as we thought they would go. Um, Andy Dyke won handily, uh, won re-election. Greg Malinowski won handily. Bob Terry did not win handily. Um, he won, ends up winning by about 4 or 5%. Uh, so what does this tell us? You know, looking at the district, I think what it tells us is more people remember Elizabeth Furze's name than you would think. She's been out of office for a long time. Um, but that's what, that seems to be what made it close. Otherwise, it was, you know, keep the incumbents. Uh, Bob Terry will certainly be in there, um, uh, but it was a much closer race than I think he anticipated, uh, and we'll see if Elizabeth Furze does this kind of thing in the future. Again, I'm kind of waiting for Lessa Coyne to come back and run for county commissioner, just for the heck of it, see what goes on. Uh, clearly, the big issue in terms of ballot measures was the Beaverton school bond, um, which passed. It's important to know that, yeah, it passed, they're going to do all these things with it, but if you look around the rest of the county, and quite frankly, much of the state, many of these money measures passed. Much more than we've seen in the past three election cycles. What's going on? I don't have my, my exit polling, so I don't know for sure, but I get a sense that voters are saying the recession is coming to an end. And so with that, we're seeing more of these things pass, except in Josephine County, where they're going to vote against anything that has money involved, and off you go. And heck, the state may take over Josephine County uh, just for the heck of it anyway. Um, so in the fall, we've got these statewide races. Um, and as uh, you heard, uh, Pacific University has already put out the, the um, invitation to the senator candidates and to the gubernatorial candidates. I've got commitments from some media people. So by gosh, we hope you get them to Washington County. You know, push, push, push. Washington County, the economic engine of the state, come here. Um, so we've got those. The congressional races across the state are going to be pretty sleepy. So there's not much else except the ballot measures. Okay, now we could have maybe not a lot of ballot measures, but every one of them could be really, really, really fun. But as we've heard, the ballot measures, they've been kind of mucking around with what the ballot measure titles are, and because of that, the signature gathering is not as far along as it ought to be. And so we'll see what happens. The deadline for that is about a month from now. It's kind of in the first, second week of July. You got to have all that stuff in. So we'll see what happens. But here's the possible ballot measures for the fall. Number one, legalize marijuana. Oh, that's going to get all sorts of people out. So there's something when you're looking at turnout, this could make turnout all of a sudden be closer to the presidential level when you have something like legalizing marijuana. Number two, privatize liquor sales. Uh, when this happened in Washington, this was the Costco measure. Uh, here it's becoming kind of the Fred Meyer measure. I don't know if Fred Meyer has made the decision, but I heard that they were considering changing their corporate rules. You may recall in the early to mid-90s, they went all the way up in the courts and they said, we're private property, nobody can gather signatures on private property. I have heard rumors that they are going to reverse themselves so you can gather signatures on private property to get this ballot measure on the ballot. So we'll see what happens with that. 
Um, I would simply point out consistency issues, but you know, that's I'm a political scientist and just kind of look at that. Um, another one which may not drive turnout, but it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with it, there may be an equal rights amendment on the ballot. Um, the, the federal equal rights amendment was never ratified, it came close, but it, it, it kind of died in the mid late 70s, early 80s, um, but we may have one in, in, um, in Oregon. One that will be on the ballot is the referendum on driver's licenses for non-citizens. Um, this was passed by the legislature, then the signatures were gathered rather quickly, so that's going to be on the ballot. This is going to be a huge debate um, that could really drive a lot of voters. So is it more of a, an immigration issue, so we have to regulate immigration, all those kinds of things, or is it more of a public safety issue, because people are going to drive anyway and they should pass a test? We don't know what's going to happen, but it's, that has the potential to really drive turnout and drive interest across the state. Uh, number five, GMO labeling. So not the crops that you plant in Jackson County, Josephine County, but labeling the foods uh, that, we, that we buy and we eat. Um, they're gathering the signatures for that. This is something that is going to bring in a tremendous amount of money to oppose it. Um, we saw in Oregon, or in Washington and California, they had versions of this that were defeated by a little bit, but the amount of com money coming in was just amazing. There is a possibility that if this takes off, the amount of money coming in could dwarf what we see for the gubernatorial race or the senatorial race. So as you're watching your television in, in October, you may see a whole bunch of things about GMOs. They're not as bad as you think. And then every once in a while, oh, this person's running for the US Senate. And they have like American flags. I mean, that's going to be about it. It's going to be very interesting to watch and see if that happens. Uh, there's going to be one that Kevin Mannix is behind called the Castle Doctrine Major. Castle Doctrine gets into issues like the, uh, the Florida laws that were involved with Trayvon Martin. So do you have the right, if somebody comes into your personal space, uh, to use a gun and, and protections in terms of legal things with that? So that could happen. That'll bring out a lot of uh, different voters. Um, another, there's, there's two more that are wonkish, um, but I, I like them. Um, one of them is a unified primary election. Um, so this is one that Phil Keesling tried to do several years ago. It didn't even get the signatures. Uh, right now there's a group that seems to be more successful at putting that together. So they're trying to get this unified primary on the ballot. Um, and so that would get rid of uh, what we saw with the low turnout because it in effect encourages unaffiliated voters who voted at less than half the rate of partisan voters. It gets them into the primaries. And so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, and then the last one, um, as the director of the Tom McCall Center at Pacific University, there is a possible movement to have a Tom McCall Day that may be on the ballot. And so I don't know what we do. We all stand at the beach with big poles and say, where's the high tide on Tom McCall Day? So that, those are possible things that, that would come up. So looking ahead to the fall, the Senate race and the governor's race, which we'd expect to drive excitement, to drive turnout, they may or may not take off, but there's real potential in the ballot measures to really drive things. And so if you're running a House race, or if you're running, there's several contested county commission races and things across the, the state. If you're running any of those, little, those lower level races, you've got to pay attention to who's turning out because of those ballot measures. For instance, when we look at the driver's license race, so what does your district look like? Is it got Hispanic voters who are going to be motivated to turn out because they want the driver's licenses? Great. So what's getting them to turn out? You got to pay attention to that. It could sway the way you think about what's going on in your district. Is it more the anti-immigration people? So what does that do? Democrats clearly would have to say, oh, we have to get more turnout to balance that off. So those kinds of things are going to be really important as, as we go through. But once again, none of this is written in stone because only one of these has got the signatures at this point. Um, I hope they all get on because it'll be really fun to look at all, all these kinds of things and see what wins out. Okay, so let's stop there and uh, see if there are questions. Thanks for coming in. It was very interesting. Um, I'm just uh, I'm a little concerned about the low voter turnout. 
And I was just kind of wondering if you had any thoughts about things that can be done to make, maybe get people long term to get more interested in voting in politics. Well, this is the, the unified uh, primary is, is one of those solutions. But we've had a variety of solutions over time. Uh, for instance, getting 18-year-olds the, the right to vote was one way of doing that. Um, going to vote by mail is another thing. Here's what we see when we measure this. Since the end of World War II, the number of people voting in elections has been wafting down. It's just kind of going slower. So there's occasional bumps. For instance, 2008, the Obama um, uh, election brought in more people. We had kind of a little bump up. But it, it, it wafts down. And, and so... Dealing with that cultural issue, no one's figured out what the solution is. Other places have said, what we're going to do is we're going to require you to vote. And so places like Australia, Brazil, Sweden, Italy, you actually are required to vote. If you don't, it's like a traffic fine. Uh, my favorite story about that is, what do you do if you don't want to vote for any of the above? Because you've got to vote. And so in Sweden, the most common write-in candidate is Donald Duck, <laughs> kind of across the board. And Italy and Brazil, where they have kind of a laissez-faire attitude to the state, uh, people will bring staples into the voting booth and actually staple the ballots so that they hope that it kind of mucks up the system. Um, but boy, they got, they got voter turnout. Um, so it's, it's, it's a cultural thing. We, we just don't see any strong solutions. What happens is when we get a change, it kind of bumps it up. So instead of at 35%, we're back to 40%, but then it wafts down again until the next change comes in and bumps up again and wafts down. So it's a, it's a big issue, big issue. But once again, we're better than Texas. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. I'm curious about the role, if any, uh, by ALEC. I don't recall the specifics of the acronym, but uh, I noticed that some 20 uh, Oregon State House members are members of ALEC, as well as uh, Dennis Richardson, and uh, no Democrats, just Republicans. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's a device to filter money into the political system in the various states and to pass laws. So I wonder if you could comment about ALEC and perhaps its role in sure. elections. I also can't remember exactly what the acronym is, but it's a national group that looks at conservative issues, especially lowering taxes and lowering regulation. And so it, it has meetings for legislators who tend to be all Republicans, it has meetings, and then also it's a clearinghouse. They actually will write laws, and so they can send them to you, and then you can put them into the hopper, and they may or may not become law. Uh, in Oregon, we have about the normal number of ALEC members that we see in most of the country. Um, so we've got 90 members of our legislature, and we kind of have 20-ish who are members of, of this, so kind of a, a quarter, a little less than a quarter. And in, in a lot of states, uh, it depends on whether or not you've got a Republican majority, then your ALEC legislation passes. Uh, this is one of the things that's going on, especially in places like Kansas, uh, where they're really rolling back the role of the state. Uh, Oklahoma, they're doing the same thing. And, and the laws are basically identical as they do that. Here in Oregon, it has not really been a source of big money. It's been more of a source of ideas about legislation to go into the, into the hopper down in the Capitol. So we haven't seen them be a, a funnel for money at all. Harry Bodine for a member. Jim, uh, your discussion about the change in the, the we be turnout when we, we be vote mm -hmm. takes me back to the question of, it's been my observation over the years that when they run those initial ballots through, the ones that come in early, that typically there's the, the total vote count in that first report is within two or three points of the final count, and rarely do you get a, a switch unless it starts off tied. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, this was, the, uh, when we went to vote by mail, um, it was a total mystery to those of us who tried to call elections about what the heck was going to go on. How are we going to figure this out? Uh, and so the, the first time we did it majorly statewide was a special election to replace uh, Bob Paquin. So it's the primary for the Senate in 1995 and then the election in January of 96 between Gordon Smith and Ron Wyden that Ron Wyden won by a, a small bit. And, and what we noticed almost immediately is patterns in the way the ballots come in and then we noticed the pattern that you're talking about in terms of how much 
when you get that first run of votes, how much is it going to change? And you're exactly right. Usually it doesn't even go 2 or 3%. Usually it's like within 1%. That first run of ballots, boom, that's it. Um, so even, you know, um, on election night, uh, looking at Multnomah County, we're trying to figure out Deborah Cafori, Jim Francisconi, and, and, you know, she got like 75% of the vote and he got like 18% of the vote. And guess what? It shifted by less than 1% as we went through the night. Um, so that wasn't a hard one to call, but it shows that the solidity of those ballots coming in. But we do know this pattern of how they could put the ballots into the machine. And so that tells us something important, important piece of information about Webby, that this, this, uh, these revelations did hurt her, and they hurt her in that last weekend. Um, but yeah, if, if you're a candidate and you're out there looking at the, 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 the returns coming in, that first set of returns, unless you have a multiple county race, and then you should be looking at the different county sites as well, but that first set of returns, that's pretty much going to be it. That's pretty much going to be it. Professor Moore, Eric Squires, for a member, I want to commend you. You have an astute political mind, and I find your presentations uh, remarkable. Thank you. Uh, I'd like your opinion on what I perceive to be a Republican referendum on Cover Oregon. For example, I'm getting emails from Dennis Richardson or uh, calls on the, 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 uh, the representative level for town halls where the one-pointed issue appears to be Cover Oregon. So to find closure on my question, I ask this, is do you think Cover Oregon is a sustainable impeachment tool for the Republicans into the, uh, the general election? Uh, at this point, I cannot say for sure one way or the other, but my sense is no. Uh, we are seeing nationwide, in fact, there's a nice story on in, in the paper this morning. Um, at this point, candidates who are running for Congress on the Republican side are no longer saying repeal Obamacare. They're now saying we need to tinker with it to make it better. And so when you see that, the same type, kind of thing is going to happen in, in Oregon. Although remember, Cover Oregon, the, the, the website, is a total disaster. But, and so will voters differentiate between the website and the Cover Oregon and things like that? But because of this national change, Oregon is not that different from the national electorate. I think we're going to see the Cover Oregon issue kind of shrink. It'll be important to a certain part of the electorate, but I have a feeling the economy is going to be the dominant thing as it usually is when we get to these kinds of elections. Ellen Perlman member, what I find very interesting is when they put the 18-year-old vote in, they can reason there in school, they can do all this stuff, but they can't reason to drink. <laughs> and, you know, there's no logic in this to me. Right. Remember at the same time that the 18-year-old vote went in, um, that we also had a lot of states that were toying with lowering the drinking age uh, to 19. So they were thinking about that. Uh, it turns out that the drinking age went up because the federal government basically put the screws on people and said, you can have your drinking age wherever you want, but you don't get federal highway money if you have it below 21. And states around the country said, we think 21 is a great age. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and it's compared to eventually the, the, the voting age was determined by a congressional amendment, by a, a constitutional amendment that, that actually lowered it. So yeah, that, that was a big discussion uh, 40 years ago. Um, if you'd like to hear about it, uh, Earl Blumenauer was in the middle of it as a, a, a young person. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, when I have discussions with my students about what you can do and what being 18 and adult means, this comes up a lot. John Bell, board member. <clears throat> I think the figures are around 31% are unaffiliated with either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Just, you know, that's a third of the people almost uh, by having a uniform uh, primary. Yeah, we would be able to get those people more to vote. Right now they're not voting because they, they, they don't have anything except the uh, majors or the, or the areas that are open, open races. What do you think about uh, bringing them in? Yeah, if, if we were to have the unified primary, then it would have one of those bumps of, of more people participating simply because of the unaffiliated voters saying, hey, there's a reason for me to vote. We're going to be seeing this tomorrow. Tomorrow, California is having its first primary with its own 
new primary rules where the first and second place person in any race, even if they're the same party, advance to the November elections. And so we'll see what happens to the unaffiliated who are about the same percentage in California as they are in Oregon. If we see them voting at something that looks like partisan levels, then we'll, we'll say, you know, that could happen here as well. Yes, uh, John McWilliams, board member, um, thank you so much for uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. We're, it's, it's really interesting, and uh, I look forward to seeing how the results. So uh, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I only get to ask one at a time, so I'll hold off on one of them. A little bit about carpet bagging. Um, do we have somebody maybe who's running in is it House District 30, Dan Mason? Didn't he run in, he ran in House District 35 quite a bit, trying to get it in there. And now he's changed how, I was just wondering if, if that would be something that might haunt him. Uh, it, it's, the issue of carpet bagging comes up a lot. Um, in the 5th Congressional District, it was an issue for both Republicans. Tootie Smith no longer lives in the district. She won the primary. Uh, her opponent had recently moved back after growing up there, going to D.C. and getting an education, working in, in, for people in D.C., coming back. She accused him of carpet bagging. It's only an issue if the opponent makes it an issue. Remember, when you get to, especially Oregon legislative races, almost the first time that people will have heard of these candidates is when they get their mailings in the door. They're not going to know the details that are about them unless the media takes off on it, which is doubtful for an Oregon legislative race, um, or the, the opponent really makes a big deal out of it. Last Chris question. Leslie, forum member. On Book TV yesterday, they had a great speaker talking about how both Democrats and Republicans are guilty of graft, especially in cities and states. Can you apply anything to, of that? idea to this election? Sure. If you look around the country, especially in the Midwest, well, basically everywhere except the West, <laughs> when you think about it, this is a huge issue. A huge, huge issue. So um, I went to graduate school in the Chicago area, and at one point, they have 50 members of their city council, and at one point, 25 of them were under investigation. And they do all sorts of things to figure that out. Here in Oregon, we tend not to have graft and corruption. If we do, it's kind of cute. Um, but it's, it hasn't become a center part of a race. So here, the usual issue that comes out is, um, like Jeff Kogan, did we reimburse him too much to go to a conference where he also had a shared a room with his lover who worked for the county? Okay, so there's nothing like, uh, I have $15 million and I just bought a home in Barbados in there. Uh, there's, did we kind of at the edges waste money? Here in Oregon, this could be an election where that takes off because there's the federal investigation of Cover Oregon, which when you look at the amounts of money are not incredibly huge, but they're huge for Oregon. Um, and if there's, a, if there's some kind of a federal decision made on that during the election cycle, it could become an issue, but it'll become an issue for one person, and that's John Kitzhuber. That's it. So, so thank you very much. Okay, for the good of the organization, we'll have an organizational board meeting after, and, um, and I'm looking forward to being so busy that I'm pressing people for last question at 1 o'clock in, in, in the fall. Yes, Bill? You know, I, I think we owe Eric a round of applause for being president for the past year. He's done a good job. That was Thank my you. best. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, I'll leave you with this. Did you guys hear about the, um, the two cannibals that ate the clown? One turns the other and said, does this taste funny? Oh. <laughs> <laughs>